So while people are still joining, while people are still joining, I see that they keep coming, which is great. Uh, welcome again to this Women Who Stay series for this fall and the women who lead the spirit as we tap the experiences of Native American women. Many of you were on last week when we had Jody Roy from the Kateri Center in Chicago. And if you weren't able to be here last week, I hope you had a chance to look at the recording from last week because many of us found um, her presentation um, very, very moving and um, we, we will long remember it. And for this week, we welcome Barbara Aston to Virtual Holy Trinity. So welcome Barbara from beautiful Idaho, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so let, I'm going to introduce Barbara, and then she will lead us in prayer before uh, her presentation. Um, and then, as always, there will be time for questions and answers. So we invite your questions either in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. Um, and, you know, we're happy to have you ask the question. Or if you wanted to send the message only to Ashley or me, you can do that as well, and we can ask the question for you. So, all right. So with that, let me again welcome Barbara, who is a citizen of the Wyandotte Nation of Oklahoma and serves as a faith keeper for the Wyandotte Longhouse. You'll have to tell us more about that, Barbara, as to what that role is. Um, she's worked for over 30 years in higher education, providing leadership for Native American programs, and serving as the tribal liaison between university leadership and tribes. Barbara was raised in the First Baptist Church and she entered the Roman Catholic Church when she was 20 years old. She has served in many voluntary or volunteer ministries at the parish, deanery, and diocesan levels and was honored to serve as a lay representative on the National Advisory Council to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Barbara has served as a spiritual director for 20 years, providing spiritual companionship to individuals from diverse faith traditions. She and her husband are both Benedictine oblates, and her native heritage and culture, along with her Catholic faith, have shaped her life. Uh, in support of her passions in life, she holds a master's of, Master of Jurisprudence in Indian Law and a Master's in Pastoral Studies. As a lifelong learner, she has just completed training as a certified staging leader for Staging International and is also pursuing training in dream work. As I mentioned, she comes to us from North Idaho, uh, where she lives with her husband of 46 years and is blessed to be a mother, grandmother, a great grandmother, a sister, and a friend. Um, so many interesting roles, Barbara, that we'll want to hear more about, but I invite you now to lead us in prayer. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for this invitation to be a part of your program. What I will begin with is a prayer that we use in our longhouse. It's a very important part of our ceremonies. It is also, uh, it's known as the words before all else or the Thanksgiving address. It's known by both of those names. And um, when this is given, depending on the elder who is doing the Thanksgiving address, it can be abbreviated or it can be very long. Mine is a uh, little bit longer than the most abbreviated, but I really want to share it with you today because it really reflects what our spirituality is as a part of our native traditions as a Wyandotte. So I will begin and I'm going to, I am going to read it because there's a lot of richness here. Um, Today we have gathered, and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty and the responsibility to live in balance and harmony 
with each other and with all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one and we give our greetings and our thanks to one another as people. And now our minds are one. We are all thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning. To our mother, we send our greetings and our thanks. And now our minds are one. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms, waterfalls and rain, mists and streams, rivers and lakes and oceans. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to the spirit of water. And now our minds are one. We turn our minds to all the fish life in the water. They were instructed to cleanse and purify the water. They also give themselves to us as food. We are grateful for the water. So we turn now to the fish and the water life and we send our greetings and our thanks. And now our minds are one. Now we turn to the plants. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working many wonders. They sustain many life forms. With our minds gathered together, we give our thanks to all the plant life and may they continue for generations to come. And now our minds are one. With one mind, we turn to honor and thank all the food plants which we harvest from our garden. Since the beginning of time, the grains and vegetables, beans, berries, corn, squash, have helped our people survive. Many other things draw strength from them too. Many other living creatures. We gather all the plants together and send them our greetings and our thanks. And now our minds are one. Now we turn to all the medicine plants of the world. From the beginning, they were instructed to take away our sickness. They are always waiting and ready to heal us. We are happy they are still among us. And we remember, and there are those who remember how to use these plants. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to the medicine plants and to those keepers of the medicine. And now our minds are one. We gather our minds together to send our greetings and our thanks to the animal life forms. They have many things to teach us as people. We are honored by them when they give up their lives so we may use their bodies as food and clothing to care for our people. We see them near our homes and in the deep forests, and we are glad they are there. And we pray this will always be so, and we send them our greetings and our thanks. Now our minds are one. We now turn our thoughts to the trees. The earth has many families of trees who have their own instructions and uses. Some provide us with shelter and shade, others with fruit and beauty. Many people of the world use a tree as a symbol of peace and strength. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to all of the tree life. And now our minds are one. We put our minds together as one and thank all the birds who move and fly over our heads. The Creator gave them beautiful songs. Each day they remind us to enjoy and appreciate life. The eagle was chosen to be their leader. To all the birds, from the smallest to the largest, we send our greetings and our thanks, and now our minds are one. We are all thankful to the powers we know as the four winds. 
We hear their voices in the moving air as they refresh us and purify the air we breathe. They help us to bring the change of seasons. From the four directions they come, bringing us messages and giving us strength. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to the four winds. Now our minds are one. Now we turn to the west, where our grandfathers, the thunderers, live. With lightning and thundering voices, they bring with them the water that renews life. We are thankful that they keep those evil things made by Aquasiris underground. We bring our minds together as one to send our greetings and our thanks to the grandfathers, our thunderers. Now our minds are one. We now send our greetings and our thanks to our eldest brother, the sun. Each day without fail, he travels the sky from east to west, bringing the light of a new day. He is the source of all the fires of life. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to our brother, the sun. Now our minds are one. We put our minds together to give thanks to our oldest grandmother, the moon, who lights the nighttime sky. She is the leader of women all over the world, and she governs the movements of the ocean tides. By her changing face, we measure time. And it is the moon who watches over the arrival of children here on earth. With one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to Grandmother Moon. We give our thanks to the stars who are spread across the sky like jewels. We see them in the night, helping the moon to light the darkness and bringing dew to the gardens and growing things. When we travel at night, they guide us home. With our minds gathered together as one, we send our greetings and our thanks for the stars. Now our minds are one. We gather our minds together to consider the wisdom keepers who have come to help the people throughout the ages. When we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way we were instructed to live. And with one mind, we send our greetings and our thanks to the wisdom keepers, those caring teachers who come before us. And now our minds are one. And now we turn our thoughts to the creator and send our greetings and our thanks for all of the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this Mother Earth. For all the love that is around us, we gather our minds together as one, and we send our choices words of gratitude to the Creator. Now our minds are one. And we've now arrived at the place where we end our words. Of all the things we have named, it is not our intention to have left anyone out or anything. If something has been forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send their greetings and their thanks in their own way. And now our minds are one. So a little bit about myself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, where to start? As was shared in the introduction, I was raised in the First Baptist Church. And my whole experience, my earliest memories are from my mother holding me and rocking me and singing to me songs like Jesus Loves Me, uh, what she called good old Baptist songs, uh, bringing in the sheaves, the old rugged cross. Oh. Amazing Grace, of course, that goes beyond the Baptist. But uh, that's my earliest memories. So it just feels like this knowledge of God's love was planted from birth. And I 
I'm very grateful for that. And I've often wondered, what is it like for someone who did not experience that? I mean, we're all shaped by our parents, by our family, by whatever teachings they give us. But for me, that was at the very beginning, and it was core. And it's always been core to my life, this uh, knowledge of God and of God's love. When I was nine years old, I was baptized, and I can remember that night very well. All the lights were off in the church, and we carried a candle, and it was full immersion. And knowing very well that I was choosing uh, to believe in Jesus. And um, when they talk about, you know, this title, Women Who Stay, I guess that throughout my life, when I've made a commitment, you know, it was a very deep commitment and um, one that I strive to, you know, take very seriously. So how did I become a Catholic? Well, I, uh, I was in chemistry class as a senior in high school and anyone who wanted to hear the recruiter from Seattle U could be excused. And I thought that sounded like a great idea to be able to be excused from chemistry. So I went and sat in, met the recruiter, filled out an interest card, had no idea Seattle University was a Catholic university, you know, when I went to hear him speak. I was accepted, I received a really good scholarship, and it was like the big city, because I lived on a small farm in southern Idaho, and how exciting, you know. So I did not end up graduating from Seattle University, but I started, I was in the honors program, which was all about the development of Western civilization. And so, of course, the Roman Catholic Church just has a major role there. And uh, when I left the university, I called up first Catholic church listed in the yellow books and said, I want to become a Catholic. And I was 20 years old when I joined the Catholic Church. And it has remained just a core part of who I am. I spent my life always seeking to learn more. But what attracted to me, I believe, really was the liturgy, was the sense of holiness, and also that capacity to embrace mystery. And as we know, not that mystery that is you know, something to be solved, but that mystery of God, that mystery of the great I am. And so that's what drew me and that's what holds me. Um, I love the words during, well, I know the Easter vigil especially, uh, this is the faith of the church. When they speak those words, I just, it really resounds for me. So in my journey as a Catholic, it's always been, I'm a lifelong learner, going deeper. I became a Benedictine Oblate in the 1990s because what appealed, you know, was that, that single-minded search for God. And my husband became an Oblate in about 2017. But now I'll shift over to who I am as a Native American woman. Um, I always knew, you know, from my youngest memory, I knew that I was Wyandotte, uh, my grandmother's Wyandotte, my mother, my father's German, English, and Scottish. And I can remember in elementary school, I'd go over and over in my head, okay, I'm this much Wyandotte, I'm this much English, I'm this much Scottish, but I just couldn't figure out how much American I was. I thought it had to be a fraction in some way. So it was kind of confusing uh, as a child. I was very close to my grandmother. Sometimes I'd spend the whole summer with her. She was in many ways the most important person in my life almost because of how close I was to her. And she really shaped, I think, who I became or how I saw, you know, how you were to be in the world. And, you know, she would share stories with me, and um, it just, I always felt so close to her. But I remember as a teenager about just experiencing, as I got old enough to really think about things, this sort of cognitive dissonance 
because what I saw on TV, what I saw in books, uh, in movies, usually how Indians were represented as savages. And I was scared. I remember this one book I saw one time and it was showing these pictures with the Tommy Hawk and painted faces. And I found it, I think it could almost give me bad dreams, but I didn't connect as a child. That was not, there was just no connection to my grandmother in any way what I was seeing and what was being presented about who Indian people are. And because we, um, she was born in Oklahoma and then she went to South Dakota and lived on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation and that's where my mother was born. And during the depression, they moved back to Oklahoma to my grandmother's land allotment. And that, but there was no way to live, hardly no, way to make a living and my grandfather knew someone in southern Idaho so they moved there and that's where I was born. But uh, in the 1990s I uh, I think it was early I wish I if I wrote it down I haven't come across that journal yet. My journals are haphazard I just grab one and start writing in it and so I would have to put them all together to figure out any chronology, but I remember praying. I said, Dear Lord, if there is a way for me to know more about the spirituality and the traditions of my Wyandotte ancestors, I would really, I desire that. But I totally let go, let go of the prayer because I just couldn't imagine it was possible. Our tribe faced, in the first 10 years of contact with the uh, Europeans, about two-thirds of the people died of disease in 10 years. They, they figured the population was about 30,000, so after 10 years, there was about 10,000 left. And then through warfare and disbursement and uh, removal and relocation, uh, it, that was a couple of centuries of change. And so I just couldn't imagine, was it really possible? And I didn't do a lot of reading because I didn't trust what was out there that had been written. But I did read parts of the Jesuit relations because they came and lived among uh, my ancestors. And I really zeroed in, one of them said how one of the priests writing in his journal that they had not understood the people at all, that they thought they were heath heathens and pagans and they really had a deep belief in a creator and a spirituality. And he was remorseful of all that had happened to the people since contact. And that was kind of a saving grace for me because during this time period, I w did feel very conflicted. You know, how do I how do I make sense, not just of the Catholic Church, but of Christianity when it encountered Native people? So I'm going to, I'm trying to be mindful of the uh, time. I'm going to share a, a very recent conversation. Uh, once a month, myself and the other faith keepers from our longhouse and some tribal leaders who are women, we have a Zoom and Zoom. Zoom has been great because we're dispersed all over the country and two live in Canada and um, and without Zoom, we wouldn't have the same kind of contact. But two of them in Canada were talking, they were uh, baptized, born, baptized Catholic, and they were talking about the recent, uh, what has come forward about the uh, children uh, from the residential schools and their unmarked graves. And I guess what I would say in my work at the university, 33 years, I worked with tribes uh, here in the Pacific Northwest that, um, you know, Indian people from the communities always knew their children didn't come home. You know, they were taken away and they never saw them again, those who didn't make it. But now was a time when it was coming to public attention. Uh, so they're very angry. They were denouncing the church. Uh, they had a lot to say about the Catholic Church. And I listened. And then I said, okay, now I'm going to speak. 
you know, there is no excuse for the atrocities that humankind does to one another. And I said, there is not, I'm just kind of sharing with you now how I make, how I view things. I says there is no institution, there is no church, there are no people who have the corner on evil. As human beings, we are capable, you know, of great evil and great good. And in any religious tradition and in native traditions, tradi um, there, whenever there is power, there's a possibility of misuse of that power. And it exists in every single group of people. It exists in every religious tradition. The tradition, the teachings themselves can be very good and pure, but it's what we do with it as human beings. And I'm not living under any kind of uh, rose colored glasses. I have worked closely uh, with uh, Native people, and I know that it's, it's not fair to stereotype any people, whether they're stereotyped as savages or drunks or, or whether they're stereotyped as super spiritual. Our spirituality has great beauty in it, just as the gospel has great beauty in it. How we live that out, though, is... Uh, you know, up to each one of us and how we live um, the teachings that are given to us through those traditions. And so I, I just had to, I had to speak up strongly and by nature, usually I'm more uh, quiet and I listen, but you know, there comes a time when we do need to speak up. And those are my feelings about it. And I still experience, you know, I think, uh, the topic, you know, about um, women who women who stay. Well, we can apply that to many things. It could be applied to how have I, as a Native American, stayed and embraced Christianity and Catholicism. Um, how have I remained faithful to a marriage of forty-six years? How do I remain faithful in a church during a time of social upheaval of individuals who are Roman Catholic, who, especially in this last year, we have seen so much polarization. How do we stay in our faith tradition when there are so many different things that may pull us in different directions? And for me, I see great beauty in the teachings that are part of my native heritage, the teachings about respecting the earth and respecting all of our relations, and a deep belief that in the beginning, you know, as people, as people were forming and coming to be, we all have creation stories. And to me, just like the story in the Bible about Adam and Eve, it is to me, I interpret it as, as we come into our consciousness of who we are and as a people, and we, we wrestle with the questions of where we come from. These are the, our creation stories, how we came to be as a people and what the teachings are for us. And the creator, you know, gave instructions in the beginning for how we are to live. And regardless of what has happened to us as Native people, what's happened to our lands and broken treaties, all of this does not change any instructions we receive from the Creator. And those instructions are to respect and care for all of our relatives, just as in the prayer that I began with, all of our relatives in creation, we have a responsibility to so um, I, over the years, as I said, I wrestled with different things and I have, I came to a place where at peace with uh, both my Christian uh, teachings and beliefs and the gospel and the teachings 
and beliefs that we feel come from our Creator of thanksgiving and respect. And one thing I shared with the other faith keepers in our conversation that stirred up around, uh, around the boarding schools, I think my mind just went blank. Oh, was the teaching I received from elders here in the Northwest who I've had the most contact with because I live such a distance from my own tribal community. Everyone, every tradition was respected. You know, we have these, the tribes up here have a meeting three times a year, and there's about over 50 tribes that are members of that regional organization. And wherever the meeting's held, then they invite those tribal elders to give the blessing and the opening prayer. And always the way it was begun was, I am going to give this prayer in the way I pray. And I invite you to pray in your own way. And, and uh, <coughs> excuse me. And so some of them let their prayer as a Catholic, you know, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, some were completely traditional, like what's the seven drum uh, out here in the Northwest, or uh, some, there's the Shakers, which is kind of, it draws on some Christian principles and yet incorporates native traditions. And this is what I learned from the elders here, is we respect one another and we pray in our way and invite others to pray in their way. And so that's what I shared with my friends. I said, among our people over all these years, we have people who are Christian, Catholic, Baha'i, Jewish, Buddhist. I mean, every possible tradition. We have those who are nativist, I would say. They, they want to follow and practice our traditions according to uh, what was done many years ago and is still being continued. But the, the bottom line, when we come together, we've brought back the main ceremony of the green corn, which is a Thanksgiving ceremony. And that is a time just to come together of one mind where we are giving thanks. And the opening prayer I shared with you is that Thanksgiving address, those words before all else. And that is something that can unite all of us in one mind and one heart, regardless of what other paths or traditions in life. Uh, at the heart is gratitude and thanksgiving. So I think this is, I, I'm probably coming close. Um, let me think if there's something more I'd like to share. I, I think I'll, um, I'll probably wrap up now and be glad to answer questions. Um, any questions you have about what I've shared or about my views or things like that. Thank you so much, Barbara. First of all, the, the prayer was amazing. <laughs> And, and I hope that we can um, invite you to share a copy with us so that we can meditate on that more. I, I just, the, the prayer just for, for me, just, just these layers of this respect for um, the relatives of creation. Um, and again, bringing to mind for me that our, you know, the focus on climate change and creation and Pope Francis Laudato Si and, and just, you know, the, the native people have so much to, to contribute and offer to help put us all in touch with, with that beauty. Um, so thank you for, for that. Uh, so one of my questions as a, a fellow Benedictine oblate is which monastery of oblation are you? I'm uh, the monastery of St. Gertrude's, which is in Cottonwood, Idaho. And I would share, I think we have some very forward thinkers there among the uh, Cenobitic community uh, in terms of looking at where we are today, where there's diminishing numbers of those who are uh, professed 
we have a large Oblate community. It's over 100 people now. And I see shifts and changes there, you know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so we live in that time of a lot of changes taking place. I, I think I would add, you know, I'm remembering some of the things I thought about speaking to. And I just finished a book called Seven Sacred Pauses by Macrina Whitaker, if I've said her name correctly. It's one of the most beautiful books I think I've read, and it's very clear that she, her years of prayer, and she's a Benedictine, she, I know she's walked on now, but a Benedictine nun. As you read that, you know this was a woman who lived this prayer, and there were so many pieces as you look at the hours of the day and what they call us to in prayer that just resonated as well for me with my native, native heritage about that awareness, like the first prayer of the morning of awakening and the second one of blessing. And it just, uh, to me, it resonated with this awareness of creation and taking that pause to appreciate. Thank you for that reference. On, on that note, uh, Maria in, from our group here asks, also as a Benedictine Ablé, um, have you found that the Benedictine travel through vigils, matins, and on through the cycle of time also relates well to your native heritage? Yes, definitely. I just, in fact, I am just finishing. I'm at the very end of the book. And the hours of the day and these cycles, I just think it does resonate deeply. And in, in the native tradition, I don't do it every morning. Uh, <laughs> one of my goals, you know, and I do it part of the time and not every day, but is to go out at sunrise and and a prayer of, like the speaker last week shared, that prayer of, of directions. And um, bringing ourselves into that rhythm of the day and of the seasons uh, is a very beautiful practice. And it also places us in where we are, where our feet touch the ground and having an awareness of where our feet touch the ground. And like mine, I'm a, I'm a guest here in Northern Idaho and I live, my feet touch the ground in the traditional homelands of the Nimipu, who are known as the Nez Perce. Um, and having an awareness of where you are, where your feet touch the ground and the directions, you know, and where we're positioned in that space. And, who the people are that live there and whose historic homelands you are living in. That's beautiful. Thank you for those words. Um, other questions? Again, you feel free to raise your hand. We can monitor that as well, or you can kind of wave at us. <laughs> Whatever you would like to do um, is fine. Barbara, I had a question. Can you talk more about how you you gathered the faith keepers for the longhouse? I mean, you kind of said that you felt called to to go back to your your tribe, but didn't know when you were praying to God how to do it. And it sounds like you did do it. So I'm just curious how that journey may have been. Okay. Well, in 1994, a friend of mine, her cousin, who is Delaware, Wichita, and Caddo tribes was working with the state of Ohio and they were uh, working with their historical society and they were inviting back all the tribes that were removed from Ohio. And so I believe it was 1832, the wind up. Our traditional homelands were in what is now Ontario, Canada, but we were dispersed from there. We moved down into the Detroit area and then into the Ohio area and we were there until a forced removal uh, in 1832. It was following Andrew, Andrew Jackson's act that forced all most of the Eastern tribes uh, 
to the west of the Mississippi. So they were hosting an event where they had speakers invited from all the tribes that were forcibly removed. And uh, several members of our family, we attended that. And I only found out of it, about it because of my friend at the university who was, whose cousin was helping organize it. So that was the beginning. And then in 1996, my mother and sister and I made our first trip to Oklahoma to see where our grandmother's allotment had been, where the school, she went to a residential school, but because she lived within a mile, she didn't stay overnight. Every day a horse and buggy come and got her and her siblings and took them to school and took them home at night. And I'm sure that was a blessing uh, that uh, she didn't have to be removed from her family like so many. Uh, so that was our first trip home, and I spent time meeting people. And then in 1999 was a very significant event. Um, there's we have it. There's a reserve in outside of Quebec City, and when the disbursement occurred in 1649, from our homelands, our historic homelands, um, we had held. They call them in English, the Feast of the Dead. So we had a very unique burial practice that was none of the tribes surrounding us had the same practice. And one of the Jesuit priests recorded that one. And in last 1649 was the last known Feast of the Dead. So about every 10 or 12 years, we did a mass burial and um, in between those times, you know, the remains were wrapped like in hides and put up off the ground. Um, but then when it come time for the mass burial, all the remains from the last burial were taken and buried together. And so Brubolf, uh, who was later a martyr, he's a saint, um, during the attacks against our people, he was captured and more than once and tortured and killed. But he recorded, he even recorded music or the sang, songs that were sang. So of course the anthropologists uh, and archeologists were searching for this burial ground and they found it in about 1949 and they dug up everything. And of course, this is this is common, and it probably still goes on. I mean, across the country, a serious problem of of digging up the remains of a you know of Indian people, and so all these remains were taken to the um, Royal Museum of Ontario, and had been stored there, and the reserve. Uh, our people ended up dispersed in four primary areas, but some of them went with the Jesuits back to Quebec, and that's where they have a reserve. And some of their leadership had negotiated their, um, they wanted to bring the four different from where we were dispersed together for a celebration and to be in greater conversation with one another. And that ended up correlating with the return of the remains. So in 1999, uh, they, the museum turned the remains over. And uh, we did it at the same time as this gathering was planned. And I flew back to uh, Toronto to attend the reburial. And that day, we, with the help of some other tribes that were still there, the Ojibwe, um, and also looking at all of the, the Jesuits were quite the record keepers. <coughs> but we held that reburial and it was nearly 600 people that were reburied. And I won't go into details, but it was a profound experience. Uh, and then just a few years ago was another reburial of, they said about 1500. So, you know, they would dig up the bones of all of our ancestors and take them to museums and universities and study them. And 
uh, but that was a powerful event for everyone who attended. And then they began planning for um, to bring back the ceremony. And a closely related tribe, the Seneca Cayuga in Oklahoma, never stopped having their ceremony. We had not had one for a hundred years. And um, that most of the people that are enrolled Seneca Cayuga are also Wyandotte. You know, this happened like the government had come in and, well, okay, you're listed as this tribe because you happen to be right here at this time when we're making a list. But uh, they helped us. They said they carried the songs for us. And they carried the traditions for us. So in 2010, we had the first green corn. And, you know, all I can say is um, it must be something of spirit. But I had met some of the folks a couple of times. You know, I'd been going back and going to some of our tribes culture week. And our longhouse is separate from the official tribal government. We are completely separate. And that happens. A Christianity did create a split in probably almost every lives, the tri every tribe that they came in contact with. A split between those who embraced Christianity and those who wanted to hold their, their traditional ways. And I think today we find that for some of us that we are able to hold both, you know, um, but I guess just in, this is kind of how it came about. And then they asked me, you know, they had met me a few times. But I think it was more the movement of spirit or something because I'm like, I live out here in North Idaho and you really barely know me and you're asking me to be a faith keeper. But as a child, my grandmother talked about going to the green corn and it was a significant event in her life. And her mother died a short, she had been to the green corn and got sick and died shortly after. And I think that's one reason my grandmother often spoke of the green corn because it was, uh, you know, was in association with when she lost her mother when she was 12 years old. So when they asked me, I felt like it was kind of meant to be that my family, my great grandmother had been a participant in those ceremonies. And now, uh, you know, this prayer that I had not dreamed really was possible. Now I had met people who had carried the traditions. And, and of course, we're part of what's known as the Iroquois. We're of the Iroquois culture. And many of the Iroquois uh, tribes, the Haudenosaunee, have maintained their ceremonies and their traditions which is beautiful, and many of them retain some of their land, you know, in New York State. And, and then there's those that went to Canada with the British and have the Six Nations Reservation. So back when I said the prayer, I had no idea how much had been carried forward to this day. And I'm in the process of um, taking, trying to learn my language. <laughs> and... Uh, so that's one of my commitments right now. I was going to say one other thing about women who stay. And the scripture that comes to mind is when um, Jesus said to Peter, was he going to leave also? And he says, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. And that kind of is the scripture that sums up why I stay is what I feel in my heart and there's still great mystery you know thank so, you <laughs> if i answered your question <laughs> part of the journey uh, and Anne marie peters has a question of what is the relationship between faith keepers and traditional catholic liturgies and Anne marie feel free to add add more to your question or whatever you want to, to ask. Well, as explained to me, our role as a faith keeper, I was to have been seated in September. I've been an acting faith keeper. I've been helping with everything since 2011. 
uh, two years ago I was to be seated. No, three years ago, and my mother passed away, and I chose to wait a year, just uh, to wait a year after she passed. And then last year and this year, both years, we canceled because of COVID. The place where our tribe's located was like a hot spot for uh, the variant. And so uh, a beauty of it was I held the green corn here at home for our family members and taught them about the ceremony. But as a faith keeper, we are how this is, how we're instructed is we are helpers to, to the creator. It is a life commitment and we are there to serve the people. So for me, this is, uh, this resonates with where I feel called in my Christian faith, that we are, we are part of the body of Christ, we're to love others, we're to help others, and our relation, we are the helpers to uh, the Creator, to God, and how we live and how we serve others. So as a faith keeper, I have a role in our ceremonies. Uh, and the faith keepers, one thing about our tribal traditions is the women had a very strong role. In fact, according to the great law, which came from a Wyandotte man who went to the other Iroquois nations, and that's how they formed their confederacy. We didn't join them at the time. We had our own confederacy, but um, the women had a very strong place. It was up to the clan mothers. And that's what now we call them faith keepers, but back in the day it would have been the clan mother, the head of a family. And they chose who their uh, council leaders were. And there were war councils and village councils. So one, one council took care of the external and one the internal village affairs. But the clan mothers would choose who those men leaders should be because they saw them grow up and knew what quality of person they were, and also they could remove them from their position. So, uh, you know, a lot of the U.S. government, they kind of studied the Iroquois Confederacy, and I think one of them was quoted as saying, if these savages can establish a government like this, surely we could do better. I don't know if that was Ben Franklin or who that was attributed to, but uh, I don't remember. But they did leave out, the U.S. government left out the role of the women. And I think we would have been better off had they included that part. Because there was the Clan Mothers Council. Amen to that. Other questions? Oh, I see she asked about Catholic liturgies. Right. Well, I think, you know, it's, there's not really similarities except that there's reverence, you know, that the actions have meaning, just like our sacraments are efficacious, you know. Uh, all of our sacraments help to bring about what they stand for. And in the responsibilities in the longhouse, there is a certain way in which you do things. And mm -hmm. so I would just say that those might be the, what's in common, you know, there's a reverence when you go into the longhouse and there's a great respect and there's a way in which you move and walk in the longhouse. So, um, and prayers are done, you know, those are things in common. And we're looking to the creator, you know, Right. And all that we do. So Lee Jones, yeah, so Lee was asking about the First Nations version, um, indigenous translation of the New Testament, um, and was wondering, um, you know, um, so Lee, help me out here. You were talking about uh, whether it could be meaningful in teaching children, but also about whether Barbara's tribe was involved in the creation of that. You want to say more about that, Lee? Well, I I just um, just 
uh, three or four days ago received my copy of it that I got the reference from um, the talk last week. And I, I think that I have this right, that there were many, many tribes who contributed somewhat to the planning of this. Was, it, was your tribe or any, you, you know, were people from your tribe involved in that? To my knowledge, they were not. Mm -hmm. Our current uh, chief mm -hmm. was a minister of, I believe it was an evangelical church. Christian church. Oh, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but I was so, I had never even heard of this translation until last week. So I am anxious and hope to order. Is that a place we can order? Yeah, thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's just, it's the Amazon link to that translation. But I, I would say, to my, it's a good question. And I will check into it, but I kind of doubt it. Okay. Well, what I'd like to say to the group, since we all heard this for the first time last week and don't know much about it, I've just started exploring it. And my, the language is so beautiful. And I think that it would, it is a, a way to speak to children in a, of about the scriptures and in catechizing them um, because it's just it 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 just sounds um, I don't know it's so full of the whole of earth and creation and it's almost like a cosmic view of um, of our own salvation history so I highly endorse it <laughs> well I I'm very much looking forward to getting a copy. It makes me think of a translation years ago of the Our Father, and mm -hmm. it was made by a Benedictine monk, and he had studied that original language of Jesus. And of course, Jesus was an indigenous man right. of his <laughs> land, and he had said in that in the Aramaic language that Jesus spoke that every phrase he went through the Our Father, every phrase, and I'm just going by what I read in right. his article. I don't have any expert knowledge otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, every phrase could have layers of meaning and layers of ways of being translated. And it was so beautiful. And when I read it, his, his attempt to translate in English and give this fuller mm -hmm. understanding it felt so indigenous to me. I just loved it. And I think when people are close to the land, we're all indigenous to the planet Earth. Yes. That's the conclusion I'm coming to. We're I all indigenous yeah. to the planet Earth. And therefore, we all have a call to, to uh, be attentive and to come to know this Earth. Mm -hmm. that we are part of better and to care for. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate your, your talking about it. <laughs> Thank you. So Jane is wondering about the artistic images behind you, Barbara. Both the uh, what's on the wall and the turtle. Well, I'm of the big turtle clan. And so uh, I, I I go to all kinds of Indian gatherings and I found this beautiful drum that a woman had made. And of course, with the turtle, I, I thought this is a drum for me. <laughs> and this picture was actually the work of a woman from, I can't remember, she's from a Northwest Coast tribe. And what she would do is take pictures of common, common scenes and then with the software on her computer, she transformed that picture into an image. And so I don't know if you can see the gold in it, but it was a picture of a barn and there was straw stacked outside of the barn. And, you know, I grew up on a farm, had all different kinds of farm animals. My dad was a farmer and and I was just taken with it because then it was transformed. And so um, I both, I loved the picture and I wanted to support her work. 
and I honestly did not get it put up until after I retired. <laughs> I retired two years ago, and for me, it's all about transformation. But it captured that, that sort of farm girl in me, I guess, because that's the picture that was transformed here. And in my tribe, red and black is just used a lot. I mean, we're not the only tribe that uses a lot of red and black, but it was very, it's a very strong color for us. Over if we have a, a minute, I also wanted to ask you about the, um, your service on the National Advisory Council to the U.S. Bishops. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that role and kind of what's on the, the council's agenda and what input the bishops are looking for or have received? Well, it has now been, I'm trying to remember what year. I think I had a four year term and I must have concluded that in maybe 2014, 2015. I'm not real good at remembering all my dates, but um, to be selected from, there's each of the regions that are part of, you know, the United States Catholic Church, and they choose a lay woman and a lay man as a representative from each rate of region. And the bishop, um, the diocese I'm in is the Diocese of Boise, Boise, Idaho, it includes the whole state. And he had put my name forward to the bishops who are part of this region, which is like Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Alaska. So anyway, there's also uh, professed sisters and monks and priests who serve on that. It's a large, a pretty good sized, large body of people. And we met twice a year and we could put forward resolutions, things that we felt that the bishops for their consideration. And then also they would put forward questions to us. And of course, everything that we heard and all the dialogue there was to be in confidence. Um, I will say that uh, sometimes they would bring forward things for our review and comment back. And back at the time, they were responding to the sexual uh, cases. And when they were developing the material that they wanted to share and have implemented for training within parishes, that we reviewed that and gave comment back. And um, so, you know, it was very, it was a fascinating process, and I think any time I had served on our deanery council and then our diocesan council, and that's where I really got to know our bishop. And then I, he started a Catholic Charities of Idaho and asked me to serve on that uh, board of directors. And then from there, he put forward my name for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And, you know, <clears throat> I felt that our input was respected, you know, once again, it's advisory, but um, I would just say it was challenging. And uh, of course, well, you, you don't want everyone that just thinks alike. <laughs> so people we were able to express and when we voted on different resolutions, I liked their process where I completely disagree or I completely agree or I somewhat agree. So it really gave a, I know they have a name for that kind of, of uh, recommendation, but it really helped give the nuances of where this overall council uh, leaned, you know, in their thoughts about the different things. Thank you, Barbara. I hope that's helpful, but that yeah. was... Yes. Yeah. Other, other questions from anyone? Um, All right. I'm, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Really, Go ahead, just, a, just a comment, Barbara. I, um, forgive me, I don't know an awful lot about the regional 
tribes. I didn't realize that the Indians, that there was a regional. For instance, I, I heard you mention Iroquois. I'm from Western New York, and we have the Tonawanda Indian Reservation there, but the Iroquois and the Mohawk, the Iroquois that you spoke of, are they across the country, or are they just now in the Northwest? Oh, no, they're, the traditional homelands are very much in that region that's now New York State. And of course, back during the revolution and, you know, there were those tribes that formed what's known as Iroquois Confederacy. They were aligned initially with the Dutch and then with the English. And uh, my ancestors, the, the Wendat, were called the Huron by the French. We were aligned with the French. And so as the battle in, ensued between the English and the French, mm -hmm. um, well, they, the Dutch and the English gave the tribes they were aligned with weapons and guns. And the French mm -hmm. did not distribute those to the tribes they were aligned with. And we were really, um overtaken you know and then dispersed uh, yes. and we we moved we migrated out of that region pretty much pushed out of that region except for those that went to quebec city and came on down we traveled about for a while and then some settled around detroit and some settled around ohio mm. but culturally and linguistically we're very related and many of the, primarily the Mohawk took a lot of captives from our villages. Mm -hmm. And that was a practice because one, there was a lot of decimation by disease and warfare. And if you took captives from another village, it helped replenish and they adopted. And so there's a lot of Wendat blood among the Mohawk, especially from, from back then. But there is a group in Canada that actually, I think they're just referred to as Iroquois, but that's yeah. not the people's own name for themselves. You know, we all have our own name for ourselves. And Iroquois being out this is just people like me <laughs> that have left our Indian community or our reservation. But the very first missionaries that came out to the Northwest were Indians from the Quebec and Ontario mm -hmm. region because they joined the Hudson Bay Company. And that's who first brought, they brought their rosaries, they were Catholic, and they shared things about the faith here in what's now North Idaho and Eastern Montana, across the Northern part of what's now the United States. Interesting, thank you. Thank you. Robert, thank you so much. Um, I'll echo the words of Aaron, who said that, you know, this is another wonderful session, and we're so grateful that you were able to join us and, and share um, aspects of your life and your wisdom and why you stay and what's so meaningful to you about both your, your Catholicity and, and your Native heritage. So we're really very grateful. Well, thank you.